the generosity of the donors is what's always surprising. And we have people who donate $5 a month, people who donate all the way up to $500 a month. And you just get to keep seeing these people who are investing in Alzheimer's San Diego and investing in the community. So I think surprising is when we went on a big gap from 74 to 100. We went on a big jump and it was really that we kind of had a tracker. We set a goal of 100 and we did a couple email campaigns around that. And the tracker was really motivating for people. As soon as we put the tracker in, I think our second email of the series, it just was like, sign up, sign up, sign up. And so that was like my biggest surprise, at least in all of the years doing recurring donors. Hey there, you're listening to the Missions to Movements podcast, and I'm your host, Dana Snyder, digital strategist for nonprofits and founder and CEO of Positive Equation. This show highlights the digital strategies of organizations making a positive impact in the world. Ready to learn the latest trends, actionable tips, and the real stories from behind the feed? Let's transform your mission into a movement. Hey there. If you missed last week's episode, I did something a little bit different. I shared a full episode from the We Are For Good podcast, and it highlighted the social media strategy from the Michael J. Fox Foundation because it was too good not to share with you. And this week, there's another podcast I wanted to share with you, and that is What the Fundraising by Mallory Erickson. Now, Mallory's show typically brings in personal and professional development experts from outside the nonprofit space, which is super cool. And they talk about sharing lessons and strategies on how fundraisers can think differently about their work to really positively disrupt and shake up the nonprofit sector. This episode I'm going to share with you here is a little bit different. She interviews Caitlin. She's a data manager at the Alzheimer's San Diego, really exploring the day-to-day experience of making recurring giving work with limited capacity and time. So I thought this would be perfect. She shares the organization's journey from very humble beginnings to now establishing a thriving monthly donor program. Caitlin also discusses how they seamlessly integrate monthly giving into everyday operations, leveraging technology and automation to really enhance donor engagement while maintaining that personal touch. So I thought this was such a perfect episode to share with you as the Monthly Giving Summit is coming up fast. Join me on September 5th and 6th for the only free virtual event that is dedicated to helping you build, grow, and sustain subscriptions for good. I really hope you enjoyed today's episode from the What the Fundraising podcast. Thank you, Mallory and Caitlin. Welcome, everybody. I am so excited to be here today with Caitlin Wyan. Caitlin, welcome to What the Fundraising. Thanks for having me. Let's start with you just introducing yourself to everyone and telling them a little bit about what brings you to your work and uh, our conversation today. Okay, great. So I started working in nonprofits when I was finishing my master's degree in history. I started working at a local museum and I loved museums so much. So like a lot of people with a degree in history, I decided that I was going to go stay in museums. And I work in two local museums in visitor services. While I was in both of those jobs, I had a friend who was really, really passionate about data and data hygiene and all of these things that it just kind of was contagious. And so I started leaning more into these things. So when an opportunity came to work in data at Alzheimer's San Diego, it really felt like kismet. In 2015, I'd lost my grandmother to Alzheimer's. And so it's something that I'm really passionate about about because I've lived it, I've been through it, and I've moved over here in 2018, and I've been here ever since. And it's just such a lovely organization, and it's just such real good work to be a part of the San Diego community in this way. That's amazing. And I love when we get to you know be involved in organizations that have been really important or have played a big role in our lives like that. So that's a thank you for sharing that part of your story with us. So today we're going to talk specifically about sort of one arm of the fundraising that's happening over at your organization, which is your recurring giving program. And 
we're particularly interested in, I want to learn more about your program, sort of how it got started, the role that it plays in your you know, donor and organizational community and how it's sort of connected to everything else. So let's just start with telling us a little bit about the program, maybe its origin story and what it looks like today. Great. So for our recurring donor program, we started it when we started as an organization in December of 2015. We had a forum available and we got donors who 5% of those donors are still with us today as recurring donors. It's a program that we are able to run kind of independently as needed. It's something that works pretty easy for us because it's on our forms and we are using Neon One as our database. And so it's on all of our forms, but we also have a specific form that's meant just for recurring donations. And so it is right there. You go to our website, you click hover over donate monthly giving is right over our uh, one of our first tabs on the donation form. So people can easily find it and give. And monthly donations are so important because it helps sustain our free programs. 100% of our programs are free to uh, people living with dementia and their care partners. And so without recurring donors, we can't really keep those programs free. So it's, it's really a big part of what we do here. Yeah. I mean, monthly giving in so many ways, you know, create more sustainability and, you know, just planning ability for nonprofits. I'm curious, like in terms of, so having that option obviously is, is great. And I saw on your website that you also have a special page, you know, dedicated to what it means to be a monthly giver. What are the ways in which you all have worked to sort of build identity or community around folks who decide to participate in giving in that way? So that's still something that we are building up a little bit. But what we do is we try to tell our monthly donors and all of our donors exactly what their donation gives us. So our acknowledgement letters, our newsletters talk about how they're giving back to the community, how they're supporting our education, how they're supporting our clinical services team to be able to provide expert help back to the community and how, you know, we have all of our programs run because of that. So we make sure that that message is just shared over and over again with them. And then we also make it really clear on our website, on our monthly section, like you said, that monthly giving is going, is directly impacting our programs. We also last year just started doing something with our direct mail company where when we check in in the middle of a year for our kind of fiscal year end, we sent a thank you to our recurring donors talking to them about our impact. And we didn't ask for any more. We, it didn't include a remit or anything. It was just a simple thank you that is letting them know that they are appreciated and they're part of a community. And then another thing that we do is we also have a secondary monthly giving program, um, which is their, a one-time fee of $1,200 or $100 a month. They can become a visionary. And a visionary for us is somebody who's really investing in the community and they're committing to $1,200 a year. And then it culminates at our visionary luncheon where people can purchase a ticket. It's a luncheon and auction, and they get to be a part of that. And then we honor someone in the community who's considered a visionary and how they're giving back to the community. Okay. So that's sort of like, because I get this question a lot with monthly giving, like, should we ask for a specific amount or if we're creating more of like a quote unquote kind of membership feel with our monthly giving, how do we deal with that with different tiers? So essentially you all have kind of created two not totally separate programs, but you basically created like an open monthly giving program where everyone's encouraged to give monthly, but then at a certain level and above that there is this sort of like membership element to your monthly giving through that visionary circle. Yes, correct. And that is something that we do in kind of name, not name only. Of course, you'll be invited to purchase a ticket to the luncheon and auction, but we aren't giving any sort of kickback with it or anything like that. It's just letting you know that, hey, you've given $1,200. You're a part of this community. You're really representing our donors and being a monthly donor in this way. And so we get that for that. And then of course, we also, we open the way we ask with every form, someone can become a monthly donor. So it's not necessarily that they they maybe just found our form randomly while searching and if I, from Google you know Google SEOs or they went there intentionally to become it in whatever form they find their way to they can switch it over to monthly and give recurring as well. Okay, great. And so I'm curious 
you know, you, I want to go back to something you said a few moments ago around the letter that you sent out to all of your monthly donors and, you know, there was no ask, ask involved and it was just an opportunity for gratitude. Do you find with, you know, when you think about your monthly giving program and that visionary program that the stability of their monthly giving allows for you and your team to sort of be more creative on the communication side about how you can connect with donors without trying to figure out how the giving is incorporated into those connection points? Yes, absolutely. We are really mindful about not always talking to our donors when we just want to ask for money, not always for a fundraising aspect, all of that. We are always trying to make sure that they feel appreciated because the thing is, you know, 60% of our monthly givers are also clients as well. And that statistic is, is right around the same for our overall donors is we have so many people who are using our services are the ones giving back to us to help keep those services free for themselves and for others as well. And so we don't want to just be like, gimme, 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 gimme all the time. We want to make sure that they know that, you know, what's going on with our, our programs, what's going on with our peer to peer events, um, you know, that they're appreciated. And so we, we try to take that time to either not ask at all with a few communications or to have it be a very secondary, you know, soft ask at the bottom, just to donate form where if they wanted to donate, they could, but we were, we want to prefer to have those organic touches where we're communicating to them, not always asking for money. I mean, 100% of our programs are free, so money is really important. (laughs) But we want to also make sure that people feel valued. And we know, I think anybody who's ever given to a nonprofit knows that you can be inundated with emails left and right. (laughs) And most of the time, you might be throwing them away. And so we want to make sure that our emails aren't just getting lost in there and that the donor feels appreciated as well. Okay, so you said something in there that I really want to dig into a little bit, that piece around 60% of your monthly givers are clients as well. I A lot of nonprofits feel like they need to really segment out clients from their donor database that it's quote unquote, I think some there's some fears around quote unquote asking clients to then become donors. And that's probably because of the like one outlier client who was like, how could you ask me for money? I need your free services. But the statistic that you just shared, I think is an incredible testament to the way that people want to be involved in organizations in multifaceted ways. And that this is what, in, you know, community centric fundraising also lends itself towards is that like nobody is in one box, right? It's like, this is a community of people making this possible, receiving in ways they need to receive, giving in ways they can give. So talk to me a little bit about your all kind of thought process around that, how you approach it, because I love hearing that number. Yeah, of course. So a lot of what we do, so when anytime we're getting ready to do any sort of digital campaign or direct mail campaign, anything like that, it involves our director of development, our director of marketing, myself with the data, our CEO for approval, and, you know, depending on what the campaign is, dozens of other staff or so, but myself and the director of marketing, director of development, we try to really be mindful about how we're segmenting. And so we can have somebody who's both a volunteer, a client, (laughs) you know, they go to our education, they volunteer for something else, they've been to our support group, and then a donor as well. And so you have to decide kind of like how you're segmenting them out. But if we don't include that person, that might be somebody who once a year gives us $500. So if we get you know, if we filter them out because they're a client, we're losing that potential funding because they're such a valuable source of that. So we are mindful, of course, like if we know that somebody is living with dementia, that's going to change the way we ask. But we're not going to be afraid to ask. You have you have to ask. Like that's just part of fundraising. And so we are going to maybe not hit them as much necessarily. You know, we might be sending people eight emails for end of year giving, but our clients might not get all eight of those emails. We try to be really hyper segmented on how many times people are touched. And then what we also do too, is if somebody's already donated, we take them out. And then of course, if anybody asks to be removed from Alien, we will never hit them up for a donation again. They would get it, you know, if they want to just come to our website once a year, they would do it that way. So it's really just being mindful and strategic about who you're asking, how you're asking. And our director of marketing does some really great simple changes to a standard format 
to ask, make it more personable to them. So, okay. So based on what you were just saying before around sort of recognizing when people should be removed from certain like request lists, do you ask your monthly donors at other times of year to give? Like I know a lot of monthly uh, or a lot of organizations are still inviting their monthly donors to give to different campaigns and stuff, maybe not at the same volume, but still a lot of monthly donors still give an additional one-time gift at end of year or something like that. Can you talk to me a little bit about your strategy there? Yeah. So we do try to separate out our recurring donors sometimes in a lot of campaigns. So they're only being asked once, but we still do include them because it is true. A lot of them do still give more than one gift, more than their recurring donors. We have some people who also give an annual gift on top of their monthly donation. And so if we excluded that, that too, that's also money left on the table. And again, we're not trying to hit somebody up all the time for that. And if they don't want any kind of communication, we have ways to be able to exclude them from that as well. But it is, if you're not going to ask, you're not going to get it. (laughs) And I think our donors understand. Our donors are are very vocal and they tell us if they don't want to hear from us in any other ways. Sometimes they tell us preemptively, we'll get a check from somebody in the mail and they'll say like, never email me or or, or something like that. <laughs> so if we just walk around tiptoeing around it, I don't think we'd be as successful with recurring giving. And we certainly wouldn't be successful with our overall number because so much of it comes from individual donors. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like, tell me if I sort of have the right picture here. It sounds like, you know, there's the clear sort of monthly donor program on your website, the the sort of two different options for that, one of them being the, the visionary program. And then at all these different moments in a donor journey, you are prompting people to become monthly donors, whether that's after they've given a one-time gift or when you're talking about certain campaigns or making it clear when you have events that monthly donors sort of have a VIP access to things like you're sort of always reinforcing this movement from becoming a one-time donor into a monthly donor. And then it also sounds like in addition to that, monthly donors are invited to participate in other campaigns, other giving experiences throughout the year that could be meaningful to them, but at a lower rate than you know, one-time annual givers because of their continuous involvement, but you're still seeing, you know, traction and engagement and investment from your monthly donors in these other campaigns. Do I have a good sort of snapshot of what the lay of the land looks like? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, we, we open, we also include an option to give monthly on our direct mail remits. And then we also do a couple campaigns a year where we try to upgrade people who have only been giving individually into monthly donors too. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. I hope you're enjoying today's episode. I wanted to pop in real quick to tell you about something big that I have been working on for anyone interested in building, growing, and sustaining a monthly giving program. Now, I teased it in episode 130, and that is that I am hosting the Monthly Giving Summit, the only dedicated free virtual event bringing together organizations of all sizes to share their recurring giving best practices with each other over two half days on September 5th and 6th from 1 to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Again, it is free to register, so head on over to monthlygivingsummit.com. And if you happen to be out of town on those dates, no problem. There's also the option for a VIP ticket. It's $99 right now, and that will be going up later. It includes access to all of the recordings, some free cheesy pizza, because I realized that September 5th is also hashtag National Cheese Pizza Day. So I had to. And you get immediate access for an entire year to the Sustainers Slack group. That is a community for peers to connect ask questions, and grow their monthly giving efforts together. So if you want to check out all of the speakers and the schedule, head on over to monthlygivingsummit.com. You can also click the link in the show notes to register. I hope to see you there. Now let's head back to the episode. And then I'm curious, like, how do you, is there anything about this focus on monthly giving that has changed or changes your Giving Tuesday or end of year strategy? I think we kind of keep it separate pretty well. We don't rely on it to change. When we've done campaigns, we've done stuff for World Alzheimer's Day in June and National Caregivers Day in February. 
So it's pretty far away from recurring giving. We always make sure that there's an option to give monthly on end of year giving. And occasionally we got, I think, three donors for in December that gave monthly from our end of year campaigns. So it doesn't change anything how we see it separately because that option is always available to people. We can kind of use it as a soft ask for them to become monthly donors. And if we think that maybe they're targeted, we might try, we haven't tried it yet. But in the future, you know, if there's somebody that have given like six times a year or more, maybe we might send them one where like monthly is the default. That's something that we're really just starting to get into because we have so much more opportunity with more customized forms. We can build different forms to go with different segments, different acknowledgement letters to go with different segments. And so that's changing the way we're thinking at it. So we've had this really solid growth year over year. And now we're in a position where we can really try to start doing more adventurous things and expanding on that, on what we've done so far. And all of that customization that's available in Neon. You're doing all of that inside Neon. Okay. So that's really cool. You know, one of the things I really like about Neon is just the way that they sort of talk about and live out this connected strategy and sort of the way they think about donor relationships more holistically and community relationships more holistically. I'm curious, and you may or may not have data to support this, or maybe it's just what you think might be happening, but I'd be curious to know if you all have noticed any sort of difference in the donors who give monthly versus one-time donors in terms of their engagement in other areas of the organization, their response rate, their open and click rate on emails. like, And then if you have any data that that sort of lends itself to understanding like the chicken or the egg, you know, side of that. Because I think, you know, what you're talking about in sort of all this customization you're thinking about moving forward, right, is is starting to test all of these things. But I'm curious if there's anything you've noticed to date that has been like interesting. I think that... Well, we haven't done the data, so it's kind of a little anecdotal on my part. We haven't looked at the data for their click rates or anything like that. That's something we're just, we're just starting to get into. But given that 60% are clients and it's a little lower for our overall donors, how many are our clients? We definitely know that they're interacting with us and we get a response from them pretty quickly. I know that they're checking their emails because we do get, you know, if a credit card fails or they're getting ready to expire, we have those as automatic emails and they are opening those and following up with us. And so those are working really well. Uh, So I don't have the specific data, but I do feel like that they are a little bit more tuned in just based on the fact that they are either, you know, responding to a direct mail campaign or still attending some of our programs. So that's something that is really eye-opening because I'm going to have to check into that more. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's, you know, I mean, it's sort of like the flip side of that identity piece, right? And so I think there's this piece around, you know, identity plays such a huge role in giving, identity, belonging, connection. And I think it's probably both that people who feel a stronger sense of of identity and belonging and connection are both more likely to become monthly givers, but then also monthly givers likely develop more a greater sense of identity, belonging and connection. So there probably is no like singular chicken or egg here, but I was just sort of curious about sort of what you've seen or, or how you all think about that. Since like over the last few years in particular, has there been anything really surprising to you about your monthly giving program or anything that you sort of didn't expect that you all have seen in relationship to it? I think one thing that's just really been like a win and surprising is just that we're a really small staff and we don't always have the time to put our effort behind every sort of giving. And so we have taken kind of a a softer approach to recurring giving. And, but we've seen it grow from like 31 donors to 109 in eight years. It feels like such a win to see that. And it's consistently like, it's a growth year over year over year. It's just a nice, I like when I put it together in my chart, I get to see that nice upward (laughs) upward incline instead of a little divot or any declines. And that's something it's really cool and refreshing. And it's the generosity of the donors is what's always surprising. And we have people who donate $5 a month, people who donate all the way up to $500 a month. And you just get to keep seeing these people who are investing in Alzheimer's San Diego and investing in the community. And I think that that's something that is kind of this little nugget of like, 
really feeling like we're doing everything kind of right because the generosity of our donors keeps sustaining us. And so I think surprising is when we went on a big gap from 74 to 100, but that was my favorite moment in recurring giving. We went on a big jump and it was really that we kind of had a tracker. We set a goal of 100 and we did a couple email campaigns around that. And the tracker was really motivating for people. And I did not expect that. I just thought, well, maybe it'll be like helpful to see. But it was really, as soon as we put the tracker in, I think our second email of the series it just was like, sign up, sign up, sign up. And so that was like probably our biggest, my biggest surprise, at least in all of the years doing recurring donors. Yeah, that is really interesting because we often hear like, kind of don't focus on the benefit to the nonprofit necessarily, you know, focus on the impact that it makes, but a real testament to how sort of gamifying anything makes people more excited or, you know, probably isn't ultimately what motivates them to give, but what motivates them to give in this different way, because there's an additional incentive and sort of time box moment around why they should engage in this thing differently. So that is really interesting. I also love what you said before around, you know, not feeling like you had a ton of time, a ton of capacity to like build this huge monthly giving program, but you've integrated the prompts towards monthly giving, it sounds like into everything that you do. To me, it sounds like you have sort of two, maybe three, like kind of up level opportunities a year for people to uh, move into monthly giving. But other than that, you're really focused on integrating monthly giving into everything you're already doing instead of feeling like it has to be this whole big separate thing. Yes, that's correct. It's something that it's part of the everyday donor and everyday donation. And so, and again, because we don't have one whole staff member who we can just be like, your whole role is recurring giving. We have, we have to make it work as seamlessly as possible for us to be able to maintain it. And so making it where it's just, and that's, that's again, where, you know, I'm a bit of a neon nerd. It'll always come back to that, like neon having the forms that are just so easy and everything. And then our marketing making our website so easy to navigate all of that works in tandem to make it just kind of run itself in a way. And that's not discounting, like we are still there for the donors. There's still the human element where myself and our development team, if somebody falls off, we follow up with them, talking to people who are interested in recurring donations and letting them know what it means for this community and what it means for this organization. And so there's, it's this, this kind of little mix of automation and then a mix of the personal that helps keep it going. Yeah, I'm really glad you sort of double clicked on that piece too, because I think often I get the question like, doesn't automation make things less human? And I actually think automation gives us the capacity to be more human. It's like if we can figure out what we can automate, like there are a lot of things that computers and automation and all those things, AI, whatever it is, cannot do that like humans only can do. And so let's make sure we're doing those things and that we have the time to do those things because we're leveraging technology in the ways that it can be really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And we, you know, in terms of our automation, we have like emails that go out if their credit, if their donation fails. And so that's something that, you know, we're not going to have to call and bug them at, at first. They have the opportunity to log in and correct it or call us and correct it. And so that's the automation piece. But then the other part of that is I get a copy of that. So then if I can go in and I see that they haven't followed up on it, somebody from development can reach out and make sure they're still interested in giving, renew them because it's a busy, everybody is busy and, and swamped in everyday life. And you might read that email and then be like, oh, I'll take care of that later. And three weeks go by and you, you forgot completely about it. I'm guilty of that myself. We have too much going on to be able to necessarily do that. But the automatic piece lets me know to keep track of that and follow up on it. And then somebody can talk with them. And, you know, most of the time we get them to renew. They're not dropping off completely. And before we had that set up, people were just dropping off and their card was like attempting to run and failing and attempting to run and failing and they'd go unnoticed. And now we're able to not only make sure that we're still getting that recurring gift, also follow up with the donor and then see it and use that time to see if there's anything that they want to share with us, if they need anything, if maybe they need something else from one of our services. And then, you know, there's often times where I'm talking to a donor and I end up having to transfer them over to our clinical care coaches so that they can follow up and get some sort of service. And it 
makes it kind of easy for them because they've been meaning to call but haven't had a chance if I hadn't called them to be like, hey, how's it going? We, we wanted to, you know, update your credit card on file. And so they get that too. And so that's always a really good moment because you know they needed that help and they just hadn't had a chance to reach out. Yeah, I love that. Another testament to really like the community giving element and just that and that connected strategy, right? Around this is your community. People participate in that community in multiple ways that are extremely meaningful, not making any decisions for people about their sort of limitations in that participation, giving everybody the opportunity to be involved in multiple ways and then listening to them and respecting their feedback and engaging them in the ways that feel good to everyone. And then being that web and connection inside the organization too, where it's like, you can say, hey, let me transfer you over to our clinical staff. Like, I'm so glad I had you on the phone. Gosh, that just must feel so good to them. And so as opposed to my guess is in some places, it's like, why don't deal with that? So call this number later, you know, whereas like you that. So I really love hearing that. Thank you. I could talk to you about this forever, but I want to be respectful of your time. So thank you so much um, for sharing all this wisdom with us today. And I think this gives organizations of all sizes something, something to think about in terms of how they can start to dip their toe into monthly giving, even if they don't have a big development team, they don't have to create some massive overhauled strategy. Um, so thank you for making it so approachable. I really appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Can you tell I love talking all things digital? To make this show better, I'd be so grateful for your feedback. Leave a review, take a screenshot of this episode, share it on Instagram stories, and tag Positive Equation with one E so I can reshare and connect with you.